Uh, I just want to start by thanking Brandon and the Staglin family for creating this amazing event. Um, so what I'd like to tell you about is a project that's underway in my lab, and the goal of this work is to develop biomarkers for diagnosing different kinds of depression and for developing better treatments. And along the way, I'd like to kind of give you a whirlwind tour of some of the technologies we're using to tackle these problems, mostly because I think, uh, for me, um, these technologies are really exciting. They are enabling us to ask questions that just a few years ago we couldn't even contemplate asking. And I think a lot of people share my view that they're a big part of the reason why I'm excited about coming to work every morning and why I think there's a lot of reason to be hopeful for, for advances in uh, mental health and, and the way we treat mental illness. So before I start, what are biomarkers? So we've heard a little bit about them today. For the purposes of my talk, biomarkers are things we can measure, blood tests, brain scans, tumor analysis, objectively measurable indicators of a disease process that we can use to diagnose an illness or predict treatment response. And biomarkers have been really important in pretty much every area of medicine. They've transformed the way we treat cancer, the way we treat cardiovascular disease, a host of other conditions. But in many respects, some exceptions notwithstanding, there really aren't any biomarkers in widespread clinical use in, in psychiatry um, that, that can reliably diagnose uh, illness in individual patients. Um, and that begs the question, you know, uh, why has it been so challenging to develop biomarkers in psychiatry? I think part of the reason, of course, is that our bio understanding of the biology underlying these illnesses lags other areas of medicine. But part of it also has to do, I think, with a related problem, which is how we diagnose mental illness. And before I go on to tell you a little bit about efforts in the field to improve the way we diagnose mental illness, I think it's important to understand where our current diagnostic system came from and what a positive development it really was in many ways. Um, so the, the way we diagnose mental illness today, the DSM, we hear about it all the time in the news, uh, it was born in 1980. but. It had its roots partly in a study that came seven years before. And I think this is really interesting. So this study was published in Science. Uh, it was directed by uh, David Rosenhan, a Stanford psychologist, who set out to answer kind of what seems like a pretty simple question. Are our diagnoses in psychiatry reliable, or are they really prone to bias? And the results were really shocking to a lot of people. Um, so briefly, without dwelling on this too much, what he did was he sent his team out to hospitals around the country, all sorts of hospitals, and they did something a little devious. They went to these hospitals and they pretended to have a single psychiatric symptom. They said, I'm experiencing auditory hallucinations of a voice saying the word hollow or thud. But in every other respect, they answered these questions honestly and fully, and, and what happens next is what was interesting. So at pretty much uniformly, all of the subjects, all of these pseudo-patients were diagnosed as either schizophrenic or having manic depressive psychosis, which we call bipolar disorder today. And all of them were admitted to a hospital. And at that point, they said the voices have stopped and they answered all questions honestly. And they basically behaved like the healthy people that they were. And yet, they stayed in hospital for weeks. And surprisingly, uh, the original diagnosis pretty much uniformly wasn't questioned by the medical teams. So it's kind of strange. Um, you know, these are well-meaning doctors and nurses and clinicians. No one was questioning, uh, you know, whether they wanted to do their jobs well. But having this preconception of these people as sick really biased the way they viewed their behavior. Um, a couple of really, like, striking examples. Uh, some people who uh, were kind of bored, and so they'd hang out in front of the cafeteria uh, before lunch, were noted by nursing staff to be exhibiting um, uh, obsessive eating behavior uh, consistent with the oral acquisitive nature of the schizophrenic syndrome. These are perfectly healthy people. Uh, uh, one gentleman who liked to journal his experiences was noted to be exhibiting pathological obsessive writing behavior. So 
these are well-meaning people, and, it, and you could see that their, their impressions of their patients were really biased by their preconceptions, but it kind of got worse, <laughs> and I'll move on quickly. Um, it kind of got worse because in part two of this study, he made an agreement with uh, the director of a famous research hospital who basically said in so many words, this could never happen at my hospital. This was really an atypical experience. So he said, I'm going to send an undetermined number of pseudo patients to your hospital, and your job is just to guess who are the pseudo patients, who are the real patients. So over about three months, they evaluated 200 people, and they found that about 20% of them were definite imposters, and about another 20% were probable imposters. And the truth was that they were all real patients. He hadn't sent anybody into the hospital. So you can see how we could be biased in both directions, and we're all guilty of this. It's easy you know, for us to laugh in retrospect, but I think I don't know that we would necessarily do so much better if we were using the same diagnostic system today. But we aren't. Um, so DSM-3 was born partly to fix this problem. Um, and the way it did that to improve reliability and the replic replicability of our diagnoses was to lump people together um, under broad diagnostic labels. Um, and that was very successful. And again, it's been really a really transformative, positive thing for people. It's gotten, made sure that people get the healthcare that they need. Um, but all along, we realized that there was a limitation to the way we were doing diagnosis in DSM. And that's that by lumping these people together, we're probably giving people the same diagnostic label who actually have very different problems. Um, we heard about TBI causing depression, for example. People who are depressed because of TBI probably don't have the same problem as people who are depressed for other reasons. Um, that's especially true in depression. Um, there are many ways to be depressed. 256, to be precise, you can combine five or more of these nine symptoms in 256 different ways. We all agree that depression is not just one thing. The trouble is, how do we go about breaking depression down into subgroups that might get us more traction at understanding the biology and developing better treatments. The historical approach to this problem has been to subtype people based on kind of clinical symptoms that tend to co-occur. So for example, seasonal depression, some people get depressed uh, with changes in the seasons, and then we test whether they have kind of neurophysiological correlates of, 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 of their depression that differ from other people. Um, and we've learned a ton from this, but um, by and large, we haven't really identified any uh, biomarkers in the end that reliably differentiate depressed people and, and healthy controls in these subtypes. So an alternative approach uh, is to try to cluster people based on shared patterns, shared neural signatures of, of brain dysfunction. Um, but that begs another question. What should we be looking for? What should we be clustering people on? What's a promising thing that we can measure? And if you scan people's brains, people who are depressed, what you find is that, like to use an analogy to a computer, the hardware is all pretty much normal. Um, the brain of a depressed person and the brain of a not depressed person look basically the same. Um, but that similarity belies this tremendous diversity just beneath the surface. So each pixel in this MR image of a brain contains microcircuits composed of thousands of different cell types. And those cells, in turn, um, are tremendously complex in their own right. And um, over the last few years, uh, we've come to realize that in many patients, depression may be fundamentally a disorder of dysfunctional synapses. So synapses are connections between nerve cells. And new technologies are really enabling us to um, understand how synapses um, are, are, are altered by factors like stress, um, which is a really established risk factor and known trigger for depressive episodes in many people. Um, and what we're beginning to get is that stress has really potent effects in everybody uh, on, on the remodeling of these synapses that occurs every day in every one of our brains. Um, another example um, are these cells, which also aren't reproducing real well. But this is a, a, a new technology that uh, combines two photon microscopy, which enables us to peer deep into the brain uh, with single cell precision, um, with these proteins that cause cells to fluoresce in proportion to how active they are. So now we can use this kind of technique to understand how these different cells are interacting to support behaviors that are interesting to us um, in trying to study depression and how they're altered by stress. And one thing we've learned is that stress reliably um, with chronic stress causes a loss of synapses that formed early in life that are normally very stable. And um, it's likely that losing those synapses has important consequences for the function of the circuit, 
Um, but we can't use those techniques in people. Instead, we can use MRI. Um, so this is kind of um, one proxy for understanding how, uh, how, how synaptic connections are altered in the brain of a person um, non-invasively. This is uh, kind of a normal uh, MR image of a brain. And this is a, an MR image that has been sensitized to respond to uh, to, to the metabolic activity and, and how active a, a group of cells in each pixel is. And you can see um, about 15 years ago it was discovered that regions of the brain that are tightly connected tend to fluctuate spontaneously um, in a correlated way. So we can indirectly measure how functionally connected two brain regions are using this technique. And we found that in both stressed humans um, and in stressed rats, we see this parallel loss of connectivity in prefrontal circuits that correlates with deficits in attention shifting, which is a function we think is probably important in depression and in other psychiatric conditions. Um, and interestingly, when we look at people with depression, we find that these connectivity deficits tend to cluster in subsets of people, so they don't occur in everybody. And that led us to ask, um, to what extent connectivity deficits like this that we can measure with fMRI might cluster in, in groups of patients who are depressed, and whether we could um, identify subtypes in that way and then develop tools for weighting those connectivity features in a way that would enable us to diagnose an individual as depressed or not depressed and as belonging to one subtype versus another based solely on their brain scan. And this is very preliminary work, but um, we've assembled a big data set with the help of a bunch of people all over the country who were generous enough to share their data with us. And um, we found that, um, and this is, this is preliminary still, but in a small subset of that data set, um, there are at least three very different patterns of abnormal connectivity, atypical connectivity in these folks. Um, here are these heat maps. You can think of them as a map of how the brain is connected. Warm colors mean more connected in depression. Cool colors mean less connected. And uh, I think the message I want you to take home is just that they're very different. <laughs> um, and so what we're trying to do is develop algorithms for, um, for using this as a diagnostic biomarker. Um, but uh, and I'll conclude with this. Um, we don't need biomarkers for the most part to diagnose depression, right? Any of us can look at a friend or family member and we can see that they're depressed by looking at their face, by looking at how they interact with us. It's not a tough diagnosis usually. Um, on the other hand, selecting treatments is really hard for depression. Many people don't respond to, to the first treatment they try um, and they take months to take effect. So it would be really great if we could use these tools to predict who is gonna respond to which treatments and even better, maybe to develop better treatments that targeted specific problems in specific people. So that's what we want to do next. And we have some very preliminary evidence that this might work. Um, this comes from people who are undergoing uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation for depression. Without going into too much detail here, the, the, the gist is that this is a tool that it, it's FDA approved for depression. It's usually reserved for people who have failed other treatments. And it's, uh, it works by rapidly stimulating the brain with a magnetic field and it, in, and it modulates the, we think, the connectivity within these, within these circuits. And what we found is that, um, that TMS uh, tends to um, let normalize some of the atypical connectivity patterns that we see before treatment compared to after treatment. And even more importantly, we can, we can predict who's going to respond to treatment and who won't based on the patterns of connectivity that we measure in their brain scans prior to getting treatment. So that, that could be really powerful. The thing I want to emphasize here, and I think it's really important for all of us as scientists not to, you know, to avoid overselling our results, this is very preliminary and there's a tremendous amount of work that's going to need to be done before we can use this uh, in a clinical setting. But I think the, the gist is that there's reason to be hopeful and optimistic. Um, and with that, I'd just like to, again, thank the Stangle family and, and IMRO for supporting this work. It's really going to move it on to the next stage, um, particularly in taking the work back to animal models and trying to develop better, more targeted treatments. And, and I also just want to highlight um, the, oops, the folks in red <laughs> who generated uh, this data and were generous enough to share it with me, and it wouldn't have been possible without them. Um, thank you all. Do we have...